welcome to the Tuesday edition of DC Today. It is not quite Fed Day, but sort of the precursor when you get CPI because there's different elements of markets that want to respond to what they think the Fed will respond to out of the CPI data. And uh, here's where we were. The futures were uh, flattish. They were down a bit. This morning, the CPI number came at 5.30 a.m. Pacific time, and the futures were up 220 points, and then they were down 100 and moved all around from there. So at one point this morning, the market got up uh, quite a bit, and then it was down. Then it came back up and stayed uh, flat for about the last four or five hours and in fact was uh, down 150 points at the end of the day after being down a lot more and at one point being up more. So exactly what I would have thought would happen with the Dow happen where there was just a bit of shaking out of the trees, so to speak. Quite frankly, it wasn't that much. I mean, um, if you look at the upside that the markets have had in recent days and then to get a 150 point down day, it really was quite benign. In fact, the S&P was basically dead flat on the day and the NASDAQ was up uh, half of a percentage point. But I want to go through just the inflation data itself, if you don't mind. And there's a few things I need to kind of read here. Um, the CPI number was expected uh, to come in at 0.4% on the month uh, for core inflation, which is exactly what it did. It was expected to come in at 0.5% for headline inflation, which is exactly what it did. And the year-over-year -year number was down to 6.4%. Um, keep in mind, it was at 9.1% last summer. So you've now had almost three percentage points of disinflation. Um, last month's number was 65 so there was even a little bit of disinflation from last month, uh, despite the fact that um, energy prices moved over, this is the seven uh, moved higher. This is the seventh month in a row of a declining inflation rate. Uh, core goods have now deflated, not merely disinflated. The key difference is disinflation is a lower rate of a positive inflation number meaning prices are going higher, but they're going higher at a lower level than they had been. They've disinflated from whatever the number was before that you're comparing it to month over month or year over year, what have you. Uh, deflation is when you have a negative number of price growth. And so numbers have actually gone lower and core goods um, have uh, deflated at an annual rate of nearly 5% for the last four months. Um, that's a deflationary drag. And I think that it will wear off in the months ahead. I don't think you're going to continue to see deflation in core goods because the base effect, the number it's being compared to from a year earlier, will itself be going lower and lower. And I think that starts to have an impact. But then the reverse becomes true as it pertains to the impact of shelter. I've talked about this a lot. Owner's equivalent rent in this month's CPI number we're up 0.7% on the month, which is nonsense. Uh, they're up 7.8% on the year, which is nonsense. So the disinflationary impact from shelter becomes more visible. I think by March, certainly April, it starts to pull in where it becomes a negative drag on the number as opposed to a, a boost higher on the number as a result of the data reporting lag of the real impact of primarily rent prices to a smaller degree, housing prices themselves. On the core goods number, I just want to make clear that uh, uh, when we look at why goods prices have come down, it is very much the inverse as to why they went up. And shipping costs from China, this is one data point. I could use 20 dating po data points around supply chain rele relevant factoids. Shipping costs from China are down 90% from where they were a year ago. So if people don't believe that prices being 10 times higher for shipping was part of the input to higher prices, then I guess they don't believe that prices coming down 90% is a factor in them being lower. But in fact, I think it remains 
very obvious that that was a large factor and the inverse or unpacking of it becomes a large factor the other way. Um, so just to summarize, CPI and PCE, Consumer Price Index and the Personal Consumption Expenditures, those are the two numbers you get uh, from the Fed. Uh, the CPI grew at 11.1% first half rate and a 1.9% second half rate uh, in 2022 in terms of full annualized numbers. 11.1% uh, in the first half of the year, 1.9% in the second. With PCE, um, it went from 8% uh, in uh, the first half of the year to 2.1% in the second half. So two different primary inflation reads, both showing this massive drop in the inflation number. Um, so that's about all I have to say on the inflation side. I think it was not a big surprise. It wasn't like the, unlike some of the past more recent months, uh, the December number we got in January and the November number we got in December, where those were also very benign and moving downward, but maybe more so than expected. This was also downward and I think reasonably benign yet expected. Okay. Um, the uh, small business optimism number rose about half a point, not a big deal, but something positive, better than dropping because it had dropped two points in December. Lael Brennard, who is the vice chair of the Fed uh, right now, has been named uh, President Biden's choice as the National Economic Council director, replacing Brian Deese, who'd been in the same role. Brian Deese had been President Biden's first uh, selection for that role, replacing uh, Larry Kudlow, who had served in that role in the Trump administration. Um, consumer discretionary was the top performing sector today, up over 1%. Real estate was the worst, down 1%. Treasury bonds barely moved, up three basis points. Yields really didn't move on the announcement. I think that's all I got. That's a lot to chew on, a lot of data, but I wanted you to get that full summary of CPI on today's Tuesday DC Today. We'll see you tomorrow, Wednesday. Thanks for listening, watching, and reading the DC Today. Mm -hmm.